uh, regular session of the day is going to be Barry Warsaw. He's going to be talking about Mailman. As soon as we get the thing switched over here. Great, okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about Mailman 3. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, just to give you a brief background, I got into Python about 1994. Um, a few years later, Guido had come to the States and we had sort of pulled in the python.org infrastructure. Uh, we were running uh, our mailing lists on a uh, mailing list server that shall not be named. Um, it was not Python based. Uh, and. Uh, so we, um, just to cut the story short, we, we uh, someone, uh, John Viega in the community invented uh, Mailman. And uh, sometime after that, a few years later, I uh, got involved in the project and somehow uh, became the uh, uh, project leader for it. So uh, those of you in the front row who know me, I've been talking about Mailman 3 for uh, many years now. Uh, well, it's finally time uh, to get a release out, so I'm here to tell you about some of the major features, not everything, but the major fe new features, and uh, to get you guys really psyched up to download it, to bang on it, submit bugs, participate, come and sprint. So I want to start uh, by asking how many people have seen uh, it's a Wonderful Life. It's awesome. It's the best movie ever made, okay? And um, there's a lot of reasons for it. First of all, it's sort of a feel-good, wholesome, nice, uh, Christmassy movie with this bizarre science fiction parallel universe plot device stuck in the middle of it. Um, but the other really cool thing about it is that it's got, there's a quote in this movie for like every situation you can possibly encounter in life. And I, and I just love this movie for so many reasons. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, in a very brief nutshell, you've got this uh, guy named Mr. Potter. He's, he's old and mean and rich, and he owns the bank, and he owns almost everything in the town, uh, in this little town in New York, uh, except he doesn't own this little institution called the Building and Loan. Uh, George Bailey over here, the guy in the middle, um, has inherited the Building and Loan from his father, and um, it's the one thing that uh, Mr. Potter doesn't own, and it really galls him. So there's a scene in there where he calls George in, and he's sitting across the desk. Uh, in fact, George sits in this little chair, and he kind of squishes down, and Mr. Potter's looking down at him. And he's basically trying to bribe George uh, by offering him a job at 10 times his annual salary, I did the math, um, to essentially shutter the building and loan. Um, and he says to George one really interesting thing. He says, um, he says to him, he's kind of buttering him up, but at one point he says, um, you hate the building and loan almost as much as I do. And you can kind of see the pain on George's face when he realizes that that's kind of true, you know? So, and of course, Jimmy Stewart being the uh, amazing actor that he is, you can really see that. So sometimes I feel like Mailman is kind of my building and loan. Um, <laughs> Although I would say maybe not hate is not the right word for it, but put it like this, uh, all the pain that you feel with it, I feel with it as well. So I'm gonna show you how Mailman 3 will make your life wonderful. Okay, so uh, another very quick story. Uh, Canonical hired me in 2007 to integrate mailing lists with Launchpad. Um, now at the time, Launchpad was not free software, it is now, um, and um, so we had a couple of problems with this integration. Uh, because it was not free software, and yet Mailman was GPL'd, we had to create a very bright line between the two systems so that they could be separated if we ever needed to do that. Uh, the deeper problem is that Mailman 2 really is not architected whatsoever to be integrated with external systems. One of the killer features for Mailman 2, or actually Mailman 1 back in the day, was that it had this integrated uh, web UI, which was really cool because before that nobody could really control their mailing list uh, manager through the web. Um, and back in 1996, Mailman's web UI actually looked pretty advanced, pretty good. Of course, you know, here we are in 2012 and it actually looks like crap. Uh, well, it's looked like crap probably for a decade, but we'll, we'll uh, gloss over that for the moment. So, 
The integration between Mailman and Launchpad, you can actually go and get, download the source if you really feel like looking at the pain, uh, is through these XML RPC polling loops, and there's all this lag and delay and things like that. And it's, it's really pretty nasty, but it does work and it is stable. Um, but that whole experience of trying to integrate Mailman with an external uh, web, serve, web uh, uh, application really kind of helped inform sort of my vision of what I think the next generation of Mailman should look like. Uh, so let's dig in and show you some of the cool new stuff. Um, the first one I'm going to show you makes, will make you all very, very happy. It makes me happy too, but it also makes me just a tiny bit sad. Um, and that is... <laughs> <laughs> so those of you who know, every month, Mailman sends out a little friendly reminder, spreading joy throughout the world, saying, happy Mailman. Oh, and by the way, here are all your clear text passwords. So uh, you, uh, someday I'll actually publish all the hate mail I get every single month, asking me directly, is it really true that you send my password in the clear text over email? Yes, it is. Um, well, in Mailman 3, that's going to be gone. Um, and it's gone for, yeah. <laughs> You'll have to find another way to connect joyfully with all your users, because this won't do it. Uh, so Mailman 3 has uh, a number of... Um, uh, password hashing algorithms, uh, so you can actually pick and choose, or you could extend it if you really wanted to. Um, most of the, uh, the, the really important ones have been vetted by security uh, professional friends of mine. I know nothing about that stuff. So uh, I think by default it uses a salted SHA-1 hash, um, but there are other hashes that you, you can use. So yeah, so because we don't have the clear text passwords, there's no sense in really sending out that password reminder, uh, which means that you, as list owners, won't get that deluge of um, bounces. Okay, so the second uh, big change is um, that Mailman 3 will be backed by a database. Um, those of you have, who have popped the hood know that Mailman 2, for every mailing list in the system, you have this little config.pickle file. And that's essentially a pickle of the dictionary of the mailing list object, okay? That's how we did persistence, right? So think about it for a second. This has a couple of problems. Uh, one problem is that if you can imagine going on vacation and you're a member of three lists, what do you have to do? Uh, there's no, Mailman 2 has no global view of the, of the database. So what it does is it goes and says, oh, okay, well, let me start opening up all thousand uh, mailing lists that you have, and I'll open this one up first, and I'll read the config.pickle, reconstitute the, the object, search the membership database to see, if it's, to see if your email address is there, and if it is, then I'll acquire a, a lock, change that value, rewrite it out, and release the lock. And of course, while that lock is... Uh, uh, acquired, no, nothing else can, can really uh, change that mailing list. Um, and then it moves on to the second one, and it does that. And then it moves on to the third one. And let's say the fifth one you're not a, uh, a member of. It doesn't know that until it's actually still read that config.pickle off the file system um, and, and done that search. So it's very inefficient. Um, there's no sense of global view. There, every mailing list is a silo, so you don't really have a sense of which mailing lists am I a member of. There's no sort of user record that, that re represents you in the system. Um, well, Mailman 3 changes all that. We have, you know, probably a pretty crappy schema because, you know, I'm not a SQL guy, but, uh, you know, it, it, it does work. Um, there are users and there are email addresses and there are subscriptions and there are mailing lists. So you can uh, um, you know, join the system, you can sort of uh, create an account with the system, uh, verify an email address, and then use that to create individual subscriptions with each mailing list that you want, and then you can control those separately. Uh, so we use the Storm ORM, and uh, currently it supports SQLite and PostgreSQL. Please do contribute others. They're, it's not that hard to do, and I, I'll absolutely help you with that. Uh, we do support schema migrations. I'll say it hasn't really, there's tests for it, but, but it hasn't really been uh, pummeled very much. Um, and so once we go beta, we'll freeze the schema, and we'll use schema migrations to upgrade. So another thing you're probably familiar with with Mailman 2 is that it does sort of kind of support virtual domains in the sense that if you have example.com, example.org, and example.net all running on the same mailing list server, uh, Mailman can kind of handle that, 
right? So, you know, usually your mail server can handle it. Postfix, the, all the big ones can, can handle virtual domains. Um, Mailman can kind of handle it with one important uh, limitation. And that is, uh, you cannot have the same uh, part in front of the at. You can't have the same mailing list name in all of those domains. And there's certain ways you can hack around it, but they're absolutely hacks. Um, so Mailman 3 uh, does away with that because we use the posting address of the mailing list as the, essentially as the primary key into the database. So those are always going to be unique. Foo at example.com, foo at example.org, foo at example.net. They're all unique. They point to unique uh, mailing list records. So virtual domains, we sort of get them for free. Um, it's very easy to uh, integrate with Postfix uh, transport maps. There's documentation out there on how to, how to do that. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, Mailman 3 actually implements a little LMTP server. Uh, LMTP is sort of a simplified version of SMTP, which is the, the way, you know, every, mailing list serv uh, every mail server on the internet talks to each other. LMT is a sort of a simplified version of that. So uh, the way messages get into the Mailman system is uh, that the uh, MTA that you're using actually injects uh, to the LMTP server. Um, so that means that almost every single, uh, uh, certainly all the open source uh, mail servers support this. Uh, supports, we have documentation for how to do it in Postfix and um, some support for Postfix and I'd love to have people who know XM and SendMail and QMail uh, donate. Uh, okay, so probably, at least for me, the most profound change is um, that the core engine, which knows how to accept email, decide whether it should get forwarded onto the list membership, um, makes modifications to the email, and then sends it back out to the uh, upstream uh, MTA. That's sort of the core logic, core knowledge of, of Mailman. And so what I've done is I've ripped out the web UI, and I've ripped out the, the archiver, and essentially put a REST API in front of the core engine. Um, what this allows me to do is, I'll say in a nice way, pawn off the development of the web UI to people who actually know how to do that. Um, I, I don't know how to do that. So um, by sort of separating that out, we can have the web user interface as a separate project um, and the core engine as a separate project. Well, the other nice thing, of course, is that everything speaks HTTP, right? So basically anything that speaks HTTP can now integrate fairly easily with the Mailman core engine. And that really um, transforms Mailman more into a library for doing mailing list uh, type actions. Um, so it's based on RESTish.io. My understanding is that it's sort of level two. There's three levels of REST sort of um, compatibility. It's sort of level two compatibility, which means that we have uh, resources in the system that are addressable. And uh, it uses the pure HTTP verbs to actually can do things to those uh, resources, create them, you know, obviously get, put, post, delete, and sort of the semi-standard patch. Um, the important thing to understand is that it's an administrative interface, so it's essentially root on the Mailman core system, which means you do not want to expose this thing to the internet, okay? It's, it's intended to be exposed on localhost or on a very protected uh, interface. The other interesting thing about that, though, is that if you did want to um, expose a REST API to the internet, you would do that as sort of a proxy that knew about permissions and authentication and things like that. So the proxy would do that, and then it would essentially forward those REST, uh, REST calls to the engine. Um, yes, and it's WSGI, WSGI compatible. There's a very simple, it uses WSGI ref from the standard library by default. Okay. So, um, uh, the other, one other internal thing uh, that has been done is that when Mailman 2 sort of, sort of got a message, it basically passed this message through a pipeline. And the pipeline was, you know, a number of handlers all sort of linked together. And each one of those handlers could do a little bit of moderation, like ask questions, should this message get posted to the list? Um, it could also do m modifications to the message, so it could remove headers and add headers and do things like that. Um, it was a little bit difficult to 
um, a little bit unwieldy to, to merge those two operations into the same pipeline because it was sort of order dependent and a little hard to configure and, and customize and things like that. So now what we've done is we've separated out moderation uh, and um, modification. So moderation now sort of looks like this. Um, it, it, well, a couple of principles. So one, the moderation step doesn't modify the original message. It just sort of inspects the message and builds up some state in this dictionary that sort of follows the message through the system. Um, the, modera the moderation uh, architecture, I'm sure, I'm, you, you don't need to really know the details, but sort of the thing to notice about this is that on the left side, this thing is called a chain. And so a chain is configurable, um, and the chain is made up of links. So each one of those nodes on the left side is a link. And links have two things. They have a rule, which is sort of the, the left half of the node, and they have an action. And what the rule does is it inspects the message and it basically gives a binary decision. Did the rule hit or did the rule miss? If the rule misses, it does one thing, and if the rule hits, it does another. So in this case, uh, the rule might hit, and it would, the, the top uh, link, if the rule hits, then it would send it off to an accept chain. That's, that's a rule that says, you know, is there a password buried in there somewhere that magically uh, approves the message for posting? And it's just a short circuit to accepting. Uh, if the rule misses, then it just moves down to the next link in the chain, and it goes along until it reaches the bottom, at which point it does a default rule, which says everything matches, which means go ahead and accept the thing. Now, this really is nice because you can, it's, the, the system is completely extensible. You can add new rules. You can add new actions. You can compose them into new links. You can arrange the links in any kind of way you want. You can name those chains. And you can say, hey, mailing list, when you get a new message, send it through this chain or that chain. Um, OK, so modification. So once a message has been accepted to the mailing list, right? So, so the, the um, moderation phase basically has four endpoints. Either the message is discarded, which means it just gets logged and chucked, or it gets, bound, uh, it gets rejected, which is essentially a bounce back to the original sender, or it gets uh, held for moderator approval, or it gets accepted. So if it gets accepted, that means we're going to send a copy of it to every member of the mailing list. And once that happens, it goes through the moder moderation uh, modification pipeline. This looks very much like a Mailman 2 uh, pipeline of handlers. Um, and it does things like add and delete headers. It can scrub out content types if you want it to. It can add headers and footers, uh, things like that. It looks very similar to Mailman 2, although it's just the handlers that do the modification, the preparation of the message for sending out to the mailing list. So that's what it kind of looks like. Another thing to notice is that one of, one of the other things it does is it can send copies of the message to other queues. So for example, if we wanted to uh, build a digest um, for people who like to get digests, we have a little digest queue. So once the message is pr prepared, we can send a copy off to the digester for uh, occasional big chunks of, of email. Um, or we can send it off to the archivers. We support multiple archivers now. Uh, or we can send a copy off to the outgoing queue, which is the thing that actually talks to the M MTA and goes out to the membership. OK, so uh, one other interesting thing. I, I, I put this in here because I sort of just landed it before I got, I, I left for PyCon, so I was especially jazzed about this one. Um, so one of the things that you can do in Mailman 2 is you can say, oh, for every message that, you that you know, a member receives, we're going to add a little footer. Um, and the footer can say things like, oh, you're, just, you're getting a message from the Foo mailing list. And to post to it, you send a message to foo at example.com. And to change your options, you can go hit this URL. Uh, one of the things that you couldn't do in Mailman 2 is, let's say you had a mailing list where some people speak Italian, and some people speak Spanish, and some people speak English. You couldn't um, customize those footers for the language of the recipient to sort of make things a little more friendly for them. Uh, in Mailman 3, you can do this now by, at, I've added a sort of a level of indirection. So instead of actually having the text of the footer be an attribute of the mailing list, it's a URL which points to the footer text. 
And one of the things that Mailman does is it actually, you can see the, the um, pattern is the list name, which is the full list name, foo at example.com, slash language code, so that would be IT, FR, whatever, EN, and then the template name. So Mailman will fill in the list name and the language for whatever context it's using. Um, and then it will hit that URL to get, the, to get the template. And then once it's gotten the template, there are other placeholders that it can fill in for all the user-specific or mailing list-specific uh, information. So it handles any, any URLs that URL lib2 uh, handles. And it also has these special mailman colon URLs, which essentially uh, point to internal uh, templates that live in the file system. And the interesting thing about that is that you can put your customizations in the file system and they can override on a, on a list-specific basis or the domain-specific basis or on the entire site. So, for example, uh, uh, you could say mailman colon slash 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 uh, 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 generic template dot uh, txt. And that would uh, apply to any mailing list that ha doesn't have a more specific uh, override. Okay. Uh, a, a few boring things. Um, yeah, so <laughs> Mailman 2 doesn't really have any tests that you can run if you're a normal person. <laughs> um, yeah, and Mailman 3 has a, has a pretty extensive test suite. It also has a lot of doc tests that hopefully do a, a good a better job of documenting the system than covering the system um, so that you, you can really, you should be able to go to the docs and really look at and understand the internal APIs, how things fit together uh, and whatnot. So hopefully much better documented, much better test suite. Um, interfaces everywhere. I use Zope interfaces and it's really great along with the Zope component architecture because it really allows you to, um, it, it provides another level of extensibility and customization that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, most of, the, most of the, uh, the internal APIs use things through those interfaces so they can be pluggable. Um, you no longer have to hack on a little uh, Python uh, file to customize the system. Uh, it actually uses real any style uh, configuration files, and it does have overrides. So there's sort of a, a default any file that comes with Mailman, and then you can override just the stuff that you want to change. Uh, this is kind of a little sore point for me, but Python 2.6 is the minimum requirement currently. It works on 2.6 and 2.7. It does not work on Python 3, although I've attempted to write all the mailman specific code so that it should be easily ported to Python 3. There is a handful of dependencies like everything else higher up in the food chain waiting for the dependencies to port. It's things like Storm, uh, things like uh, Restish.io, it's, it's a couple of Zope packages. As soon as those things get ported and I'm going to try to push for that, then uh, I'll switch it over and it'll be a, mailman, it'll be a Python 3 application. And uh, finally, let's see. Uh, okay, so we're going to be sprinting here at PyCon. Uh, I intend to release the beta either during or after the sprints. I'm here to the bitter end. Uh, I invite all of you who are interested in this to join me because I'm going to give a, you know, some introduction to the code base and things like that. And then we're going to have uh, folks working on the web UI and uh, the core and whatever else people are really interested in. I do have a test server that, that's mostly up and running. It's running on a VM, so uh, right now I make no guarantees about it, but uh, I don't want to actually publicize the, the, or, uh, the uh, you know, how, to, how to get access to it. Um, but come up and talk to me about it, and I'll, I'll show you how to get on. Um, there's, a, there's a project called Grackle, which I'm really interested in. I think it's pretty new, uh, but it, it, it's, it's an, a new uh, next generation archiver that the Launchpad folks are sort of working on. And I think that it has a lot of really key concepts for how you might architect a next generation archiver. The state of archivers is uh, open source archivers has been abysmal for a decade. So hopefully this will finally push us to uh, improving that situation. And then uh, just to plug, there's a lot more technical details in uh, the architecture of open source applications volume two. If you haven't seen volume one, go to the web and read the chapters because they're fantastic. And hopefully I can keep, my chapter will live up to the really awesome uh, quality of all that stuff. Um, and then I'll just, I can open up for, for questions. These are the resources. Uh, the discussion is happening on the developers list. I'm always on uh, the IRC channel. Uh, we have a website and a wiki, and that's where you can get the code, launchpad.net slash mailman. That's it.
If there are any questions, please come up to the mic. Uh, okay, oh, this is working. Uh, two questions. Um, so you mentioned that it's backed by a database now, and then you showed us this uh, sort of state transition or state machine diagram of what happens during moderation. I was wondering, for each transition in that diagram, is it acid? Or is that like in memory? Uh, well, the, those transitions for, those are sort of how the message gets, uh, sort of the flow of the message through the system as we're processing each one of them. Um, the, the way those uh, chains are put together can really be sort of any combination of in Python code or in the database. And, and um, it, it, Mostly don't think about it as acid. It's not, it's not really acid. It's, 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 it's essentially Python code that you, you compose together to make that, put that together. Okay. Um, at least if your system crashes and it's somewhere in the chain, will it go back to like the unmoderated state so that when you start back up, it'll start through the system at the, at the beginning? I don't think it goes back to the, f uh, do I, should I repeat that? Uh, so if the system crashes, the question is, does, it, does the message, the state of the message go back to the, uh, front of the un uh, unmoderated uh, uh, phase. And I don't believe it goes back to the start, but it, it picks up back. So what happens is if the system crashes, the message actually goes off into a special queue called the shunt queue, and it just sits there forever until you do something about it. Um, there, the, there's a cron job that will eventually clean those things up, but you can fix the bug in Mailman and then unshunt those messages, and it'll go back to the uh, step that it uh, left off in and continue on. It might make sense uh, to, to go back to the top, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, and then question two is, you uh, talked about internationalization. Um, is the release going to support localization for common locales, like some templates to use by default? Yeah, so whether uh, it will support localization. Um, so there's sort of two sets of strings in, in the mailman system, right? There are sort of these shorter strings in, the, it's in a traditional internationalized uh, application, and we use you know get the get text interface to take those strings. Uh, it uses dollar string placeholders, so that's all sort of traditional uh, get text stuff. That all works great. It works great in mailman too. It'll take that string, look it up in the catalog, whatever gets returned, fill in the placeholders, and use that. What doesn't work so well in Mailman 2 is the templates, the things that are like multi-line chunks of goo, you know, that have to get internationalized. Um, that's not going to live in the, in the uh, catalogs, but because it's using that level of indirection, that URL indirection, and the language code is in that URL or can be in that URL, then that's the mechanism for internationalizing those templates. That makes sense. Does, does Mailman 3 have any way to do, um, if you have multiple lists and you want the configuration to be the same across all the lists, is there like a, a common way to do that instead of setting moderation, you know, 10 different times? Yeah, different yeah, lists? okay, so, so the question is, does Mailman 3 have a common way to sort of, if I can rephrase, to set up styles of mailing lists? Uh, yes, it does. Um, uh, when, you, when a mailing list gets created, there's a default style. Uh, that gets applied, but it's easy enough to say create this mailing list using this style or that style, and those styles are extensible. Um, I intend to uh, have sort of, I mean, so, so the default style is sort of a, a discussion list type style, um, but you could imagine a, an announce list type style or any, any style that you can possibly come up with. It's basically saying what are the default values for those for the uh, mailing list uh, configuration variables. So if you, if you change the style, then does that apply to all the lists that were based on the not style? Not currently, no. And it, so probably, it probably won't for 1.0. So I mean, it's more of a template you're copying. What's that? It's more of a template that you're copying. Yeah, then? exactly, yeah. exactly. Hey, you know, give me some code, man. <laughs> so, uh, just a curiosity, when you say that you're sending messages to other queues some slides ago, uh, why is that like an optimization to avoid going through all the mails if you want to construct to build the digest, for example? So, and it, how do you actually send this? Is it, is it using the LMTP protocol or is it just copying? 
So the question is really related to uh, the queue system in Mailman, which in Mailman 3, it's not that different from Mailman 2. It's just sort of all modernized and, and you know, the code base improved and actually tested. But uh, the reason for using multiple queues is essentially uh, an optimization. So each one of the, the, and this is something I didn't talk about because it hasn't changed that much from Mailman 2, but each one of the, there's a process that, that is sort of responsible for that queue, and that process is single-threaded. So what you don't want to do is say, oh, well, there's a really slow, uh, you know, MTA, and that's going to just back up all the other processing in the system. So what we do is we just take a copy of that, we stick it off into a special queue, and that queue, the, the process that's handling that queue will, will deal with just that small part of the problem. And so there's an archiver queue that sends it off to the archivers, a digester queue, and so on and so forth. We are out of time, um, so I need to dismiss you guys to break. Ladies and gentlemen, Barry Warsaw.